Welcome to the NIHR Dementia Researcher podcast, brought to you by DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk, in association with Alzheimer's Research UK and Alzheimer's Society, supporting early career dementia researchers across the world. Hello, and thank you for listening to the Dementia Researcher podcast. Our website includes blogs and articles written by early career researchers from across the UK and elsewhere in the world. Every blogger provides a narration, which is published into the website alongside the text. In this podcast today, we've collated those blogs and narrations from across the year to create a five-part special. I hope you enjoy them. Our first blog comes from Dr. Anna Volkmer. Many of you people who visit our website will be aware of Anna's work. Anna is a speech and language therapy researcher from University College London. We've followed her over the last couple of years, and this year has she finally finished her PhD. In this blog, she discusses how she prepared and her experience of doing a virtual viva. Doing a virtual viva and completing those darned amendments during COVID-19. At the start of lockdown in early March, I received an email from my supervisor telling me that my long-awaited PhD viva would not be going ahead. With a heavy heart, yet completely aware of the impact of the current situation, I put my revision aside. Later that week, as I perused the emails from various important people at the university, I noted a sentence suggesting that actually vivas may go ahead in extraordinary circumstances. My supervisor and I did some investigating, and lo and behold, a week later, my viva was back on. My initial thoughts were that I'd lost a week of time. And then I started to consider that I would be doing it remotely and what this might mean. But I just couldn't stop thinking about my three days of clinical work either. My viva was scheduled for the 8th of April. And in the lead up, all anyone was talking about or thinking about was COVID-19. It was a pretty tense and scary time. And all I was desperately trying to think about was my viva. It felt incredibly selfish. Despite these feelings of anxiety, I ploughed on and one week later held a mock viva on MS Teams with my primary supervisor and another kind and lovely colleague who'd been giving me lots of valuable advice all along the way. Doing a mock viva using the device that I planned to use in the room in my home that I planned to use was quite helpful actually. I started to be able to kind of visualise how the Viva would work. And I felt quite comfortable with the technical and practical side, so I could concentrate on the actual questions. I scripted as many questions as I could think of. I read my thesis multiple times. I read the work of my examiners. I did lots of work on the weekends before my Viva too. At this time, my two young children were only able to go to school two days. They had two key worker days because I was working clinically per week. And so I continued to juggle their homeschool, clinical and academic work. Now, usually I don't let these overlap at all. I try not to let my caring responsibilities intrude on my work life. However, having spoken to many people during COVID-19 about this, I think that this was not feasible during lockdown. During this extraordinary time, all domains of my life kind of blended together and maintaining strict boundaries was so tricky. So I did do work on the weekends, but I also had the children to remind me that, thankfully, the viva wasn't the be all and end all of my life at that time. I felt quite comfortable that if the viva didn't go perfectly, it didn't have to go perfectly. It just had to go reasonably. So um, when the day of my viva came, despite feeling absolutely petrified, I also felt a need to just get the thing done and just move forward. I'd also just submitted an application for a grant the day before my viva, and that helped me see forward, I think, beyond the PhD. Now, that said, the viva itself was exhausting, perhaps partly because it was remote, It took just over two hours, including a five minute break in the middle. It was a really warm day and we all needed a drink. I could hear my own children playing in the garden and arguing in the kitchen. 
my external examiner was at home himself. And funnily enough, his children popped their heads into his office in the break of my viva. But I was focused and had my thesis and some notes ready at hand. During the viva, I found myself incredibly calm. I found some of the questions really took me by surprise, while others I had anticipated. We entered some discussion and debate on some topics, and despite all the surrounding distractions, by the end, I had managed some of the questions quite well and others terribly. But I had answered all the questions, and when they advised me of the minor amendments, I felt comfortable and happy um, that I'd got this outcome. I just felt relieved to have gotten this done and not to have to wait for months to complete my viva. So I went off and had a lovely glass of champagne and a rest. After the following weekend, I slowly started looking at the minor amendments and trying to think about how to tackle these. To be honest, this is the stage I found the hardest. Toward the end of April and throughout May, I slowly started tackling these amendments. Unfortunately, this was also the time when the pandemic hit the service that I worked in hardest. So I was working much longer hours clinically, supporting staff who were much more stressed than before and much more exhausted too. When I look back on this period now a month or so later, I realised that completing the amendments was much more emotionally draining than the Viva itself. I just did not have the energy to do this at this time. Having said that, I also realised that I couldn't let it drag on for myself. And so I tackled the amendments in small achievable chunks and continued reviewing and revisiting them with the support of my most wonderful primary supervisor. A small part of me thinks I could have got, got these done in a couple of weeks if it hadn't been for COVID-19, but it took me more like six weeks in the end. <clears throat> Finally, on the day before my birthday, I submitted the approved amendments and received an email confirming my PhD award. And a few weeks later, I also found out I'd been successful in my grant application to the icing on the cake. Now, reflecting back, I think I needed to get it all done. But the following are some things that I really learned about the process. So first of all, doing the viva is not the hardest bit of the PhD but it's not the easiest bit either. The viva is a stepping stone and just needs to get done and not postponed for me. Rehearsing the viva and all the practical bits as well as the content is incredibly helpful. Family and life outside of the PhD are just as important, if not more important than the PhD and can help keep you grounded in the final stages of the process in particular. Chunking amendments into manageable chunks is helpful. Seeking advice and support for the amendments is also helpful. You do not need to do them on your own. And you do not need to do the best viva. It just needs to be good enough. It's also okay to not like your thesis by the time you've finished all your amendments. Now there is a future post PhD and it is fun. And finally, COVID-19 is exhausting, but it will not beat us. Great advice from Anna there. You'll be pleased to know that Anna went on to successfully defend her thesis and is now Dr. Anna Volkmer. In this next blog, Dr. Emily Oliver, who is a consultant nurse from Dementia UK, talks about her experiences of performing research as an insider inside the team that you're actually working within. The insider debate in qualitative research, should there be one? The debate around insider positioning in research has been long-standing within social science theory and literature. Many researchers have contended the advantages and disadvantages of being an insider researcher, questioning both definition and validity with limited consensus. In this blog, I will explore this debate, highlighting key arguments within the literature and reflecting on my own experience of being an insider researcher during my PhD. If you were just starting your research career or have not undertaken qualitative research, then you may never have heard of such a debate and may therefore not know what the terms insider or outsider means. In its basic terms, insiders are researchers that are part of the community in which they are conducting research, and outsiders are researchers that are considered to be outside of the group they are studying. 
Insiders tend to share an identity and language with the study participants, whereas outsiders have limited knowledge and understanding of the experiences of those being studied. To demonstrate this in the context of my research, I was a nurse studying a group of nurses in the hospitals where I worked and was therefore very much an insider. In contrast, somebody who was a non-healthcare professional and had never spent any time in the hospital would have been an outsider. As mentioned above, there are many arguments for and against being an insider or outsider with advantages and disadvantages of both. The literature does outline the many benefits of being an insider research, with one of those being acceptance. Researching in a field in which one is a member can allow for complete acceptance from the participants and can lead to an increased trust and openness. This in turn potentially enhances the depth of the data gathered and therefore allows for a greater understanding of what or who is being studied. Not only does this allow for rich data to be gathered, but is also an advantage in terms of time spent researching as there is no settling in period. The advantage of quick acceptance was something I experienced when conducting my research. My other PhD colleagues were organising settling in periods in which they spent time with their participants to build a rapport and develop understanding of the context in which they were researching, whereas there was no need for me to do that. I was able to jump straight into collecting data as the participants knew who I was and the relationship was already built so they felt comfortable being open with me from the first day. However, this complete acceptance wasn't without its setbacks. When interviewing, the participants would often skip over some detail as they already knew I had an understanding of the topic. For example, on more than one occasion, an interviewee made reference to the fact that I already knew that, so I had to ensure to ask them to fully explain what they meant, as if they would if I were not a nurse. Despite the advantages of insider research, there is a strong argument against insider positioning due to an increased risk of bias in interpretations and findings. Being a member of the setting under investigation poses questions about the objectivity, reflexivity and authenticity of a research project and there are ongoing concerns that insider research are often too close to the project. It is therefore possible that preconceived ideas can guide the way in which the study progresses and therefore personal experience has the potential to influence the data collected and ultimately the claims made. Similarly, another argument against insider positioning is a conflict that arises between roles. The dual role of an insider as both a researcher and a member of the community can often result in role confusion in which the researcher responds to the participants or analyses the data from a perspective other than that of the researcher. In addition to this, the dual role can often lead to a problem with loyalty in that the researcher does not want to make claims that criticise the group in which they are studying and also a member of. Although I did question my roles during data collection or analysis, I did struggle with feelings of loyalty to my profession and at times I didn't always feel comfortable with what the data revealed. I had a good relationship with my supervisor so I was able to share these concerns with them and we worked through these feelings of disloyalty together. As time passed, it became clearer to me that these feelings of discomfort were temporary and actually the long-lasting influence that my research would have was more important. Reflecting on this, I would argue that this could have happened to any researcher whether they were an insider or an outsider. Due to the length of time spent in the field when conducting qualitative research, strong relationships are built between the researcher and the participants and can therefore leave anyone open to these feelings of disloyalty and discomfort which I experienced. Although the evidence base attempts to identify whether being an insider makes a better or worse researcher, I would argue that it in fact just makes me a different researcher. I understand that being a member of the setting being explored leaves researchers open to preconceived ideas and potential bias, but I also think it allows researchers to be more in tune with the participants. The increased knowledge and experience of the field allows for a deeper understanding of the context in which the findings are situated and perhaps provides a wider picture than what is being observed and discussed. The concerns with regards to bias and objectivity are valid, however, unlike quantitative research in which participants are represented in numerical terms, I would argue that actually qualitative researchers are unable to have a distant researcher role regardless of whether they are an insider or not. As Rose 1985 explains, there is no such thing as neutrality in qualitative research. There is only a greater or lesser awareness of one's biases. Similarly to the way in which trustworthiness is assessed in qualitative research, perhaps the decision as to whether insider or outsider positioning has an effect is not ours to make. Perhaps all we can do is make our position clear and allow the readers to make the decision themselves. I believe as long as there is ongoing reflection, constant questioning and a declaration of your position given, arguably there is no debate to be had. I have provided some tips for anybody who's thinking of undertaking research in which they will be an insider. Ongoing reflection and questioning. Ensure that you continue to reflect on the claims that are being made and question where these came from and whether preconceived ideas have had an impact on these. Continue to question participants to ensure that you are not making assumptions as to what they are saying. 
regular supervision. Ensure you have regular supervision to talk through your analysis and your findings. Build a relationship with your supervisors that allows them to question what you have found and how you have found it. They may be able to uncover potential bias. Declaration of position. When you write your thesis or papers or present your research, be sure to declare that you are an insider researcher and be proud of that. Outline what this means and highlight the steps you have taken to reduce any potential bias. Very useful advice from Emily for anybody, particularly clinical researchers, who are performing research from within the system that they work. Our next blog comes from Dr. Clarissa Glebel. Clarissa is a social care researcher at Liverpool University and works within the NIHR ARCS. In this blog, she's going to talk about the importance of social care and the need for improving that in dementia. Waving the flag for better social care in dementia. The pandemic has made us realise a lot of things, I'm sure. The fact that it's nice to just go outside for as many times as we want, remembering back to the height of the lockdown, as opposed to just once a day. Or to go on holiday without having to get a negative COVID tests to show or wearing a face mask on the plane. But we can somehow get used to that. One thing that the pandemic put in the spotlight even more than before is the need for a much better social care system. That's something we can't get used to the way it was and is right now. Once someone receives a diagnosis of dementia, accessing social support services in the community, such as daycare centres, peer support groups, social activities such as arts groups, or respite care, is vital to maintain a good quality of life and to remain independent. And that's not only true for the person living with dementia, but also for the many unpaid carers, family and friends who are supporting someone living well. Access to social support and social care services wasn't great before the pandemic. People living with dementia often had to rely on having an unpaid carer who was proactive and able to find out information about groups and activities. In an ideal world, people with dementia and carers should be directed by health and social care professionals to these activities and services after a diagnosis. But this is not really an ideal world. So throw COVID-19 in the mix and what you get is a perfect storm of dysfunctioning support systems. The ability to enjoy going out and seeing peers at singing and dancing groups or at daycare centers or having paid carers coming in alleviating some of the caring duties was suddenly ripped from underneath people's feet. No more support groups, no more daycare centers, no more visiting your relative or friend with dementia in the care home for months. And this is not over yet. We hear stories that care homes are starting a second round of lockdown again. Also looking at the community sector, there have been many difficulties in slowly restarting services, if services are running at all. We have interviewed people living with dementia and carers at the start of the pandemic, and about three to four months later, and services have only been very slowly to adapt to remote support, if at all. This already had severe impacts on the lives of both people with dementia and carers. Carers noted the dementia to progress much faster and faced very difficult decisions in terms of continuing or cancelling paint carers entering the home. Many discontinued care for fear of virus transmission, leaving them to pick up additional caring duties and often being overburdened. Considering that the pandemic is far from over, with imminent further lockdown measures looming ahead. It is important that social support services are better supported to adapt to remote support provision, or indeed limited face-to-face -face services in a socially distanced fashion. But let's not forget the people with dementia and carers. They need to be better supported in making decisions of how to access care during this pandemic, because not accessing care is clearly not an option. Clarissa makes some really important points in her blog and social care research is something that needs more focus and hopefully will continue to attract the funding it needs in the coming years. Our next blog comes from Michelle Nassens. Michelle is a Dutch student studying in the UK and in this blog she talks about the challenges that the UK faces as a result of Brexit, the problems in attracting overseas students to study in the UK and what life is like for somebody who's applying for PhD positions here. Brexit, a new slowly strangling academic research in the UK. In my experience, Brexit has not been talked about positively in academic circles. 
Even before officially leaving the EU, UK charities and institutions have seen their international funding plummet. It is still unclear exactly how much this will affect research. I had not thoroughly looked into the effects of Brexit on academia as I had more pressing things to worry about. Ignorance is bliss after all. However, in June, the UK announced that EU students will no longer be eligible for home fee and funding starting the 2021-2022 academic year. This includes those students wishing to pursue a PhD in the UK. This will affect me directly as I will likely be one of those students. Hence, I had to look into how exactly this would affect my chances of acquiring funding. So that is what I did. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of information out there just yet. As mentioned previously, non-British EU nationals will no longer be eligible for home fee exchange status, domestic funding, nor student loans. In other words, being an EU student in the UK will become more expensive, while opportunities to pay for this will diminish. For me, for instance, my fees will almost quadruple from about £8,800 to £32,000, which is a bleak prospect to say the least. Having settled or pre-settled status prior to the 31st of December this year might make you eligible for domestic university fees and allow you to access student finance, but I couldn't find any official sources on this, so we'll have to find out. For those lucky enough to have been in the UK for over five years, it might be easier to simply become a British citizen if, of course, your country of origin allows dual nationality. Either way, I think the effects on academia will be profound. This is supported by the fact that, after the referendum in 2016, Russell Group University saw a drop of 9% in non-British EU students starting postgraduate research courses in the 2017-2018 academic year. For universities of which between 16 and 30% of the student body is made up of non-British EU students, that is a significant number. And I think this drop will only be exacerbated by the change in fees. Yes, having a degree from a UK university like Oxford or Cambridge can seem prestigious, but is it really worth it, especially now fees will increase? The UK has always been one of the most expensive places to study in Europe, but other universities within Europe have great reputations as well, and they don't require you to sell your organs on the black market to be able to afford it. Although, if embarking on a PhD, you might find it easier with all your organs intact. Belgium, for example, only charges 600 euros per year in tuition fees. The Netherlands, 2000, while studying in Denmark is completely free. Moreover, other countries often consider PhD students film members of staff and pay them accordingly. However, for me and many others, moving away to complete a PhD outside of the UK would mean leaving behind the life and social networks we've taken years to build. So another likely possibility is that those talented researchers wanting to stay in the UK will be pushed towards industry jobs. This is not to say that there's anything wrong with industry, but simply that academia will suffer major losses because of it. A huge part of what makes a university great is its groundbreaking and innovative research. If you remove all young and inspired researchers, what are you left with really? Academia has always been about following your passion because, let's face it, it's not where the money is or the job stability. However, following your passion must be sustainable to make it viable. Career advancement and opportunities for those EU students wishing to follow their dreams will be significantly hindered by limiting funding and increasing costs. But to be honest, with the global pandemic happening, Brexit seems like the least of our worries. Right now, it is impossible to say how exactly Brexit will affect academia and funding opportunities. One can only speculate and despairing is hardly productive. The government may come back on the decision or institutions may find ways around it. We cannot predict what will happen until it actually does. However, that does not mean that Brexit does not and will not affect people's lives, nor that it can't be a great source of anxiety. But for now, one can only wait and try their best to acquire that coveted funding. As the British would say, keep calm and carry on. Do I hate myself for being that cringy? Yes, I do. Do I care? Not really. Thanks for listening. I really enjoyed Michelle's blog. She raises some issues that only an overseas student would probably be aware of in the UK. It's the only one she's done for us so far, but I really hope to encourage her to 
to provide more contributions to the website, particularly as she's currently looking for PhD opportunities here in the UK. Next, we're back to Dr. Anna Volkmer. Having successfully defended her thesis and completed her PhD, in this blog she discusses the postdoc puzzle and the challenges of considering what next, particularly for an academic fellow. The postdoc puzzle applying for an NIHR Development Skills Enhancement Award. As the end of my PhD funding loomed ominously closer, I felt reassured that I wouldn't be falling off the edge, as so many people described it. At the start of my NIHR-funded doctoral research fellowship, I had gotten to know three other NIHR-funded clinical academic speech and language therapists, all a couple of years ahead of me in their own PhD journey. All of us had clinical backgrounds and academic interests, but all in different areas of speech and language therapy. These three other SLTs, as I will now call them, speech and language therapists, were wonderful inspirations and role models. And a key piece of advice they gave me was to plan well in advance what you will do after your funding or your PhD finishes. Stop yourself from falling off the edge. A key piece of advice from each and every one of these SLTs had been, beware going back to your old pre-PhD job. Each of them had done so, generally reporting negative experiences. So I planned hard. I realised really quickly that I couldn't finish my PhD and apply for funding that would seamlessly maintain me in a research role. I wasn't going to finish my PhD before my funding ran out for starters. But I really wanted one of those clinical academic careers that seemed to work so well in medicine. So I started working on creating my own combination. First off, I worked with my wonderful mentors at the Cognitive Disorders Clinic at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery, where the service was severely lacking a speech and language therapist with knowledge of language-led dementias. This is where all the networking paid off. I had done a number of talks and supported the rare dementia support groups and developed great relationships with people working there already. And I started early and secured myself a clinical role that I was able to transition into when my funding actually finished, whilst I continued working on finishing my PhD. Secondly, I managed to secure a one day per week contract as a teaching fellow in my department, teaching the SLT students about dementia and the psychology students about qualitative research methods. The jigsaw was starting to fit. Thirdly, I started looking back at the NIHR awards and I realised that there was a brief window of, of opportunity where I would be eligible for the new NIHR Development Skills Enhancement Award. This postdoctoral award is a trainee award that basically requires the university to commit to funding half the costs, mainly the salary, salary costs, and provides additional funding for training and mentorship. There's a really narrow window where people can apply within a year of holding a previous NIHR award, but only after having submitted their thesis. Given my NIHR DRF funding finished at the end of September 2019 and I submitted my thesis at the end of December 2019, I worked out that I should aim to apply for either the spring or the summer round of the DSC in 2020. There's currently a deadline every three months for this. So my first and biggest hurdle was to get the commitment from my department for this. I was the first person to go for this award in the department and I needed to convince them I was well worth it. So I did a bit of detective work and spoke to a recently successful awardee, a radiologist, and she gave me lots of useful guidance on considering the justification for why I couldn't just apply for a clinical lectureship or a postdoctoral fellowship. I found my final chapters of my thesis rather helpful as I started to draft the story for what I needed next for my research and training. One of the key areas I needed to focus on was outcome measures. I developed and piloted a speech and language therapy intervention for people with primary progressive aphasia 
during my PhD. And before I could consider an effectiveness evaluation, I needed to complete the analysis of all my outcomes, which I hadn't had time to do during my PhD. I also wanted to know what the most important and meaningful measures were for the participants who did the therapy. Alongside this, I needed to develop my knowledge of implementation science and trials methods for my next application. This was my basic story. My mentors were incredibly supportive and generous with their time and ideas, and it felt like a reasonable application. As it turned out, the award deadline fell in the first months of the COVID-19 pandemic and the department was unable to support me. But then in the 11th hour, they were able to support me after all. And in a final rush on the actual morning of my PhD viva, I submitted my application. Having thus promptly forgotten about this, I recently found out in June that I'd been successful in my DSC application. So this final piece in my clinical academic puzzle makes me feel that I am en route to the career I would like and I am passionate about and most importantly will mean that I can continue to develop clinically relevant research. So I'm due to start the award in October and I am so excited. I will reduce my clinical time a little bit but as of October I will be a clinical academic teaching speech and language therapist. Deciding what to do after you've completed your PhD is difficult. It's something you'll often start to think of in the last six months and is something that's discussed regularly at early career researcher conferences. With options around moving into industry, remaining in academia, or perhaps considering something along the side of your PhD like science communications. If this is something you're struggling with yourself right now, please do take a look at our website www.dementiaresearcher.nhr.ac.uk where it's been discussed several times before. The next blog comes from me. Back in March when we all started to move into lockdown, video conferencing and video calls became the norm. In this blog, I discussed ways to avoid rubbish video calls. The subject has been discussed lots since. Ways to avoid rubbish video calls. In these times of university closures and social distancing, many of us have transformed overnight from lab and office workers into home workers and telecommunicators. With most of us now relying on video conferencing apps like Zoom and Microsoft Teams to keep in touch with colleagues, as well as older relatives and for Saturday night parties and dates, but that's probably for a different blog. No surprise that with our homes and workplaces merging into one, the boundaries between our personal and professional lives are beginning to blur and awkward situations ensue. Note to self, remember to mute before you flush. Three weeks into lockdown, and I am sure a few of you have had video calls with colleagues who have joined meetings in odd places like the shed at the end of the garden or the bathroom to avoid the children. Then there are those colleagues who relax completely and let their children and pets become part of the meeting and have taken to wearing onesies. You know who you are. It's cute and touching, but it can also be really annoying and make a meeting last twice as long as it needs to, or just trash the whole thing, not to mention making some colleagues feel uncomfortable. No one wants to be a stick in the mud, particularly when everyone is just trying their best under incredibly difficult circumstances. But if we learned anything from Robert Kelly and his children in that famous BBC interview, it's that we can be prepared. So here are a few tips to help. To help your colleagues. A little preparation goes a long way to making video calls more tolerable. You need an agenda. Just like physical meetings, someone really needs to chair. You need someone to make your virtual meeting engaging and succinct. It's easy to get sidetracked. But do you need minutes? Well, one benefit of this format is the potential to simply hit record and then email a link to everyone who couldn't attend. Personally, I think a combination of the two works best. Take a note of the key actions and email everyone afterwards with a link to the recording should they want to watch back, and a note of the key actions. I asked my Twitter friends for their 
own top tips, and I particularly liked one from Sarah Gregory. If it's a big meeting or you have people new to video conferencing, I think it can be good to find a way to get everyone to speak at least once in the meeting, even if it's just their introduction or having people lead different sections of the meeting. When you're setting the agenda, think about asking each of the attendees to lead the section and think hard about why people are attending. If they don't have to contribute, do they really need to be there? They could just be sent the recording and watch at their leisure. Katie Roberts suggests that a good chair should ask quieter members of the team if they have anything to add, if you think it would help them. I find that video chats can benefit those with louder voices even more than in real life, but also think that video is better than just voice for chatting like this. Nikki Taylor makes a good point. Ask people to name themselves appropriately when signing in. Example, if it's first name only, helps with privacy, or full name so hosts know who they are letting in, example on Zoom. Also consider the benefits of using gesture in video calls to confirm agreement stroke disagreement or to signal a desire to speak. Dementia voices use I want to speak cards or participants hold something up bright. This means turn taking is adhered to without lots of disruptive noise. Check the tech. The main problem of a terrible video conference is the quality of the connection. If you can't see or hear people, what's the point? Before you start, run a quick test. One, preview your webcam. Mac users can launch the Photo Booth app and window users can click start button, then camera. Most apps such as Zoom, Skype, Teams and Hangouts allowed you to start an empty meeting. This allows you to check your picture, adjust your lighting, camera angle to make your face look properly lit. This might not be tech related, but importantly, be mindful of your backdrop. Anything you wouldn't want your colleagues to normally see should be moved. Like your copy of Fifty Shades of Grey on the bookshelf. Yes, I'm one of those people who will judge you. Or dirty laundry. Tim Skellett agrees with me. Check your background first, although he won't judge you quite as harshly as I do, based on your choice of literature or artwork. Although Twitter is, I see, if you follow the thread, hashtag bookcase credibility. If you really can't be bothered to tidy up, some apps do allow you to blur your background or even use a virtual background. But please choose something professional, not the command center of the Starship Enterprise. Nikki Taylor suggests, ideally don't have your camera facing doors where others enter. Ask people to disable video if they have to move away for any reason. I've been on trips around houses and gardens and it can be distracting for remaining participants and can compromise the individual's privacy. Anthony Marta agrees. If using Zoom, learn how to change the background in settings. This is a tip rather than directed at anyone here. Sounds like he's seen something he can't unsee. Number two, test the mic. If you're using a headset with a built-in microphone or use an external microphone, you may need to tell the app you're using to use the mic from your device. The microphones included on laptops will probably be deep by the default. You may not realize the laptop mic is being used until everyone complains they can't hear you. Try having a video call with a friend to test the background and sound and then adjust accordingly. On this subject, think about background noise but I'll come to that later. Number three, internet speeds. Bandwidth and services are slowing down in many areas. Visit net to check your internet speeds. If you're coming up at least 15 to 20 megabits per second, there's a good chance your video is going to look pixelated and there may be a delay on your audio. There are lots of articles on, out there on suggesting ways to improve this but here are a few suggestions. If you really have to, you can turn off video, but this should really be a last resort. Before you get to that stage, run around the house, turn off or disconnect the Wi-Fi on other devices that might be sapping your bandwidth. 
example, tablet, smartphone, skybox, the kid in the room next door, streaming Netflix and playing Fortnite, turning off their devices, not the children. You need boundaries. We know that families are important than ever right now. Keeping your loved ones close is important. However, that doesn't mean your colleagues want your boyfriend in his pants or dogs on his laptop or children screaming and bouncing on your head. With children at home, this can be difficult, but that's why, where possible, it's important to take a video call in a place where you can draw boundaries and be alone. The easiest way is to close the door. If you lack a home office and work from the dining table, then there really is no escaping the distraction. Just mute yourself and turn off the camera until you need to contribute. And find yourself a good set of headphones or move to the bedroom. Okay, I'm not suggesting you leave your two-year-old daughter to fend for themselves for two hours, so in those instances, use mute. This brings me back to my earlier point. If you really don't think you can join without causing a distraction, then see if you can just watch back later and try and schedule for when there will be less distraction. Kids and pets may want to say hello and that's fine during the first few minutes, but after that, hmm. So think about making muted your default. Daniel Eady says, put the dog outside or in another room if you're working from home as they definitely always want to join in at the wrong moment. Concentrate. If you have something better to do than be on a video call, example, answering emails, etc., it will be more polite to excuse yourself than to remain on a call and obviously not paying attention. Kicking out keyboard tapping noises. Back to the point that do you really need to be there? Paying attention to what's going on is important for another reason too unwelcome visitors. Nikki Taylor provides a good reminder. As the host, you're responsible for security, so take this very seriously. Be informed and ready to act quickly if uninvited guests appear. Keep learning and understanding the limitations of security settings and remind participants of their role in keeping meetings secure. When the tech lets you down, move on. If you weren't working from home, would you be video calling? The old fashioned telephone is just as good. Give it a few minutes and then quickly give up and use a conference call instead. Final thoughts. It could be a long time before we get back to normal and who knows, maybe this change of working will inspire more of us in future when distance working is an option rather than a requirement. My dog really hopes this is the case. I would love to hear your stories of video calls gone bad or further tips on how to make these calls work. Tweet us using the hashtag ECR Dementia. Thank you. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today, but we're going to be releasing podcasts like this all week to share the blogs throughout the year. I hope you've enjoyed listening to Dr. Anna Volkmer, Emily Oliver, Clarissa Glebel, Michelle Nassens, and myself, so please do visit our website, dementiaresearcher.nihr.ac.uk to make sure you never miss any of our future blogs. And do come back tomorrow when we'll have the next blog roundup from the year. Brought to you by dementiaresearcher.nihr.ac.uk in association with Alzheimer's Research UK and Alzheimer's Society. Supporting early career dementia researchers across the world.